We find ourselves in Mark chapter 11 again this morning. As you're turning there, I want to say thank you to my church. I, um, with the events of this past week, I don't know a better way to say this just than to come right out with it. I got to watch as a pastor a church love ministry this week and rally around people and just the amount of work that was done and the level at which it was done and by whom it was done. It's too numerous to count, but I'm just, I just want to say thank you to my church. I love you guys. And it's, it's an honor to be your pastor, and it really was an honor this week to see you guys do ministry. Um, thank you. Okay? Uh, that has nothing to do with the message this morning. I wish that was somehow a lead-in to our conversation, but it's not. We're going in a different tangent. And, and you may see that, having opened your Bibles and, and looking already at the chapter headings in Mark 11. Because we find a very confrontational Jesus in these words. We have different feelings about confrontation. And as a matter of fact, most of us, when we hear that word, we either recoil or we, it stimulates fight or flight in us. And some of us are prone to flight. We hate confrontation, so we avoid it at all costs. Others of us, well, we want to fight, and so it... We, run, we rush headlong into it. We like it a little too much. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I find myself probably liking it a little too much on occasion. I hesitate sharing this with you because I don't want you to think less of me, but I will just to prove a point because we all have our ideas about co- uh, confrontation and our culture throws it off and our flesh gets in the way. Oftentimes we don't handle it correctly. And I can't say as your pastor, that I've handled even the majority of confrontational situations well. Um, Please forgive me for this, but I was talking to my wife, by the way. You guys need to lighten up. I'm just saying. Fawn and I, when we first got married, went to the movie theater. And... We were watching a movie, and there were some, some teenage boys about three rows behind us. And I'm, I'm 24, 25, so full of vim and vigor. And they're using some crass language and telling dirty jokes and stuff. And, and, and I turned around, and, and I'd had enough. This was going on into the movie. And engaged my mouth before I engaged my brain. and did not. I threw off restraint, and I looked at them, and I said, I'm going to give you a fat lip. Their faces turned white, Fawn's faces turned white, she threatened me with divorce, we thought, you know, it was, I'm kidding, she didn't threaten me with divorce, but she was convinced we were going to get murdered in the parking lot because I said that, and that's just an example of maybe not handling confrontation well, it was supposed to be more funny than it was, you were supposed to laugh at that, but nonetheless, sometimes we don't handle it well, and our cultural ideas about confrontation are not helpful. Our flesh is not helpful when it comes to confrontation. If you spend any time on social media at all or any time in front of a computer screen, you become well aware with the keyboard warrior who fights every cause and every seeming injustice from the safety of their computer screen. And so you, we have that kind of idea of confrontation. We face it in the workplace with an overbearing boss that cannot be pleased and you don't know whether to duck or pucker when you walk into m- work on Monday. We have that kind of idea of confrontation. Sometimes we face it at home with unsupporting family members. Sometimes we face it at church when we feel like we can't measure up. The fact of the matter is, and we have to admit this when we talk about confrontation, is that people are exceedingly angry all the time. And I think that's a cultural dynamic that we face in our generation maybe more than any other. If you don't believe me, you just take your life into your own hands and get on the interstate about 7.30 tomorrow. And you, you sense it by the way people drive. That people are just mad. And, and then they're not only mad, but they're distracted. A- and so everything becomes offensive in that kind of an environment. People are offended at everything. And so consequently, nothing is really offensive. 
that, that everything is a big deal. And so nothing is. And that's the sad reality in our culture that because we're offended by everything and everything is confronted, nothing really means anything anymore. And that's not what we see from Jesus here. You remember a few moments ago I said that we find a confrontational Jesus in this text. We don't see Jesus flying off the handle at every turn. That, that while he's confrontational, he's not reactionary. That, that he is purposed and composed even when he's angry. And when things get physical, and they do get physical in our text... He does not digress into a fit of rage. That he's still very purposeful in it. And, and, and while he finds things that don't measure up to his expectations, he never loses control. And so he's able to confront in a way that sets an example for us. And we can learn a lot from his example. And we haven't even read the text yet, but bear with me. We can learn a lot from his example. We learn how to be angry and sin not, Ephesians 4, 26. We're told that in the New Testament by way of commandment, that, that there are reasons to be angry. But even when we're angry, we do not have reason to sin. We see that in Christ, that he remains sinless even in anger. And I, as I've already alluded to you and exampled for you, I struggle with that, and I rather imagine that we all do to some degree or another. What really ought to draw our attention this morning and what is our focus is what exactly makes Jesus angry? What exactly draws his confrontation and his ire in the first place? Because three things appear in our text here that he takes issue with, that he confronts. And as I said, this, this isn't his way. He, he's not flying off the handle at every turn that there are times when he is confrontational and he's angry, but it's always for good reason. And three of those things come to light in this text, all of them having to do with the status quo. All of them having to do with what is conventionally acceptable. And even though it's conventionally acceptable, it is not spiritually appropriate. It doesn't measure up. To what he expects. And so let's read in Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. I invite you to read along with me. We're going to read down through verse 25. It's somewhat of a lengthy passage of scripture, but nonetheless, let's just read these uh, words and these verses together. On the following day, and, and so that takes us back to last week, Jesus had gone in, into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. He had ridden on the back of a donkey that had never been written. People gathered around him, praising him, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They laid their garments on the road. They fanned him with palm branches. It was a big to-do, a big celebration. It kicked off Passover week. But when all that was over, Jesus went into the temple. He looked around, and then he went. They left the city. They went back to Bethany, about a two-mile walk back to Bethany. And he spent the night there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so on the following day, he is returning to Jerusalem. All that summed up at the beginning of verse 12. And when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. So on that two-mile journey, probably didn't eat breakfast like so many of us before we leave the house in the morning. Jesus is hungry. And in verse 13, seeing a, in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And what that really means is, is that it was not harvest season. We'll come back to that in a moment. But for now, we know that Jesus went expecting to find something, and he did not find it. And he said in verse 14, to it, to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. I rather imagine that they probably, like they did so often, began to reason among themselves. What did he mean by that? They came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and... Things become chaotic at this point. When he enters the temple, he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. 
And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. We're all going to unpack this in just a moment. But for now, I want you to understand that, that Jesus is confronting what's going on in a place of worship with violence. That he, he's, he's violent. And, and, and we have to rest in the fact that, again, he, he's not reactionary. He's not lost control. That this is calculated. It is premeditated. He spent a night thinking about what he was going to do the next day. Let's not lose sight of all of that. And, and in verse 17, he was teaching them all the while. And you can imagine as he's throwing tables over and coins are clattering on the ground and he is driving out animals from the temple, he's teaching them. He's talking the whole time, teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers, a den of thieves. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. And so he journeys back at the end of the day, having shut down business in the temple, to Bethany. And as they pass by in the morning, and so you kind of see the pattern of Jesus during the last week of his ministry, he would minister in Jerusalem and in the temple during the day and back to Bethany at night, back to Jerusalem on the following day. They passed by in the morning. They saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, and so it's dead. Jesus cursed it. The fig tree's dead. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus, again, seizing upon a teachable moment, answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Forgive so that you can be forgiven. Let's pray. And we need to ask God's blessings upon this passage of Scripture. We need insight and understanding. So invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart, and then we'll get into our thoughts this morning. Father, help us. Holy Spirit, help us. You authored these words. You inspired them. You've preserved them for us today. They are truth and they are life, and so I pray that you'd help us to understand them. And, and more than just in our minds, in our hearts, we want it to translate into action, into faith, into belief. And so, Lord, help us. And as, as we read about Jesus confronting the status quo, Father, help us to be willing to do the same. May we be willing to look ourselves in the mirror and address what is culturally acceptable, but may not be what is spiritually appropriate. It may not be what you require of us. Help us to be willing to deal with that today. For your glory, for your honor, may your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as Jesus takes issue with three different forms, and you may have seen them in the text as we read, we're going to highlight them here, three different forms of the status quo. They become three different metaphors for us as I think proverbially Jesus addresses the status quo in our lives, in our homes, and in our church. And so let's pay attention to them quickly as we enumerate them. Verses 12 through 14, Jesus confronts that first vestige of the status quo. He confronts appearances in a fruitless fig tree. So the first vestige of the status quo is appearances. That's what he sees in the fig tree. And, and we've already read the text, but let's go back to it and let's think about it because on the way back to Jerusalem, after spending the night in Bethany, Jesus is hungry. He probably hasn't eaten breakfast. We can surmise. We find evidence of his humanity there as he's hungry and suffering from the same kinds of needs that we suffer from. But in the distance, he sees a fig tree. And, and, and I kind of liken this to, we dash out of the house in the morning. We're on our way to drop the kids off at the school, to school or to run those errands before we get to work. And because we haven't eaten breakfast, 
We see the golden arches and we want to pull through the drive through And as soon as you see them, your hunger takes over and you can't think about anything else. Anybody else sympathize with that? I do. That's kind of the, let's put Jesus in context here. And so Jesus sees this fig tree. He goes over to it because it's in leaf. And that's an important description the scripture gives to us about this fig tree. What he sees leads him to believe that he should find figs on it. Even though it's not harvest time, he expects to find something to eat. Completely reasonable, even though it's not harvest time, because fig trees in Palestine, as soon as they're in full bloom, start producing figs. They're not just harvest fruit trees like apples or peaches. They begin producing figs as soon as they're in full bloom. And so Jesus sees a fig tree... In full bloom, and what does he expect to find? Figs. But what does he find? Nothing but leaves. He saw this fig tree in full bloom, but there was no fruit. And so in spite of its promising appearance, the tree was barren. And and Jesus' response to its barrenness we think might be a little over the top. He curses it. According to Matthew's parallel account, he says the same thing that Mark says, may no one eat from you again. He curses it, not just that it would remain fruitless, but we find on the following day when they return, what Jesus curses suffers his judgment and dies. When he turned to satisfy his hunger, he found nothing. And it brought his curse. So, can we talk about why he curses it? Because that may seem a little incongruent to us. If he's just hungry, can't you just go to another fig tree? Or, you know, just like we would do if if we pulled off the on-ramp and saw a line that was too long that would make us late. In the drive-thru, we would either find another drive-thru or we would just suck it up and go on. You know, but, but Jesus curses the fig tree. Here's, here's the best reason that I can come up with, okay? One of the most graphic forms of communication, of teaching by Jesus, by Old Testament proverbs, or prophets, and even in the Proverbs, is the object lesson. That Jesus repetitively uses an object lesson to communicate spiritual truth. And here in this fig tree, he finds a graphic illustration of what he had observed in the temple the day before, what he had dealt with in the the Pharisees for the last three years. It's a graphic illustration of the hypocrisy of Israel's dead religion. The emptiness of the status quo. In this fig tree, it has the appearance of fruitfulness. There was the expectation of fruitfulness, but the reality was barrenness. And Jesus seized upon that teachable moment to illustrate the religious system in Israel. That's what he found. That's what he dealt with. And so as we seek to unpack this and and apply this to maybe our situation in the church, it's worth mentioning that Jesus castigated the same emptiness, the same fruitless status quo in the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. Among those seven letters written to seven different churches, these are the words of Jesus. When he sees the church at Sardis, it's important that we understand how there is symmetry here and what Jesus says to them, and how he addresses the fruitlessness of the fig tree. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus looks at the church at Sardis, and he says, I know your works. He says that to all the churches, the seven churches in the Revelation. I know your works. Frightening concept, isn't it? Jesus knows our works. And then he goes on to say, you have a reputation for being alive. But in fact... You're dead. Just like that fig tree. You have the appearance of life, 
and at the street view, it looks like you're fruitful. But upon closer investigation, you have the reputation of being alive, but in reality, you're dead. But he doesn't leave them in their deadness. He expects them to act. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it, he says, and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come to you as a thief, and you will not know the hour that I come against you. In other words, he gives them a chance to repent. And if they will not repent from their deadness, then he will come against them in the same way he came against this fruitless fig tree. The same way that he came against a fruitless system of works in Israel. So let's think about what this means as Jesus confronts appearances. Because in reality, oftentimes we fall back on a status quo that makes judgments and assesses spiritual reality by what we see. But we need to understand that God does not look on the appearance like we look. He does not see the outside like we see God looks upon the heart. So, do you think Jesus is really that concerned about the appearance of things? About how well we look the part? Or is he genuinely concerned about our faith and the fruit that it produces? What do you think? Because reading this text and understanding how Jesus confronts the conventional, the status quo, what had been acceptable in Jerusalem was a system of dead works, of fruitless religion. And Jesus uses this fig tree to address, to confront that status quo. Do you think he's really concerned about how well we look the part? Or what's inside? The faith that we have and the fruit that it produces. Overwhelmingly, Jesus is concerned about the fruit that you're producing, not how good you look. Can we park here a minute? That, that how well we answer questions? You know, if we're talking about hypocrisy, how good of a mask we wear? And well, boy, we're good at wearing masks, aren't we? We're emotionally and intellectually dishonest. We're spiritually dishonest. And, and look, I'm, I'm not for airing our dirty laundry. You know, there are appropriate times when we need to be honest in the right setting. You know what I'm saying? But we all need to be honest just the same. And in, in, in environments like that, do you know what, you know what religious people do? just so that they, they, they want to project this image that, pe that they're okay, that they, they, they wear certain clothes and they say certain things and they have all the right answers and they, they, we start falling back on the appearance, we start judging by the appearance, and if we're judging by the appearance, then we got to look right and talk right, and if we look right and we talk right, then everything's okay and everybody thinks we're okay, when inside, man, we're falling to pieces. And then then if we take that a step further, we can begin to assess our own self-worth by appearances. That we think somehow we're right with God because we look right and we have all the right answers and we say all the right things. And Jesus isn't concerned about that. I hope you're listening. Jesus is concerned about your faith and the fruit that it produces. And if we've fallen back on appearances, then that is a dead work. That draws Jesus ire. And he confronts that. Jesus doesn't want that. Church, are you listening? Jesus doesn't want you to be so concerned about appearances. God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. He's concerned about your faith and the fruit it produces. And so as we continue to ask questions here, what, what would Jesus find if he came looking for fruit at Philip's chapel? Thankfully, we saw some fruit this week. I've already commended you, church, for it. Uh, we're, not, we're not condemned in every arena, but, but maybe this hits a little closer to home in our personal lives. What would he find if he looked at me? And God forbid it would be leaves only. You know what I'm saying? 
than a promising appearance marked by barrenness? This object lesson needs to hit home, loved ones. There's something wrong with unfruitfulness. God never intended that for us in the Christian life. For us to sit back in indifference and remain unfruitful. There is something wrong with unfruitfulness. Jesus chose us as disciples to go and bear much fruit, and he wants our fruit to remain. And so this becomes a graphic illustration of what dead works look like. And to the point, if fruitfulness becomes the norm, fruitlessness becomes the norm, rather, then people hide behind appearances. If we're honest, there was probably a time in Philip's Chapel's history where that was the case. Thank God I don't believe that's the case now. There might be some of you that are still hiding behind appearances. That, that in self-righteousness you've, you've come here today thinking that somehow... Fulfilling this obligation will make you right with God, but that is not what makes you right with God. The just shall live by faith. And that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus alone. That's what makes us right with God. And if that is the case, God has foreordained us to good works. He has prepared us to walk in good works. So if the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we should be producing the fruits of the Spirit. God foreordained that, planned that beforehand. And so, listen, loved ones. Jesus confronts the status quo of appearances by cursing this fig tree. Let us be willing to do business, to deal with that. We cannot fall back on appearances cannot hide behind them. If that's the case, those are dead works, not fruitful ones. So Jesus confronts that first vestige of the status quo in that fruitless fig tree. And then number two, he confronts busyness. Busyness in a fraudulent religion. Verses 15 through 19. I need to hurry. So bear with me, okay? I need, to, I need to give you these things more quickly. When Jesus came the second time on this trip to Jerusalem to the temple, he did not come to worship. Most people, when they went to the temple, they went to worship. They went to offer sacrifices. They went to pray. They went to worship. At least that was what it was designed for. But that's not what Jesus found the night before when he was there, and it was not what he found the morning when he arrived. And so Jesus cleanses the temple for the second time. This is how he began his ministry in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, where he purged his father's house, which was designed to be a holy place of worship, a place of prayer, but it had been corrupted. It, it, charlatans and frauds had taken over. Merchants were polluting it. Everything Jesus finds is summed up in that statement, robber's den. He found it to be a den of thieves, a place of merchandise. It's a quote from Jeremiah 7, 11. He hearkens them back to the day when they had drawn God's judgment for their rebellious ways. And Jeremiah was pronouncing judgment and captivity upon them. And Jesus reminds them that they are very much the same. And so what had transpired in the temple? It was supposed to be a house of prayer, a place of worship. But what does Jesus find? He finds the high priest and their family who had purchased their position from Rome, by the way. They were not true descendants of Aaron in that priestly line. That was a political position. They had bought that place of authority from Rome, much like Herod did, political pawns. They had turned the temple into a shopping mall. That merchants had set up their booths, 
which amounted to them selling concessions. Let's be honest about what Jesus found. If it was in our day, it would be like what we would find in the food court of the mall. There were places where you could buy a hot dog or a lemonade or Chinese food. And it, that, that, that people had set up concession stands that, that they had set up their own currency in the temple. And that temple taxes were to be paid with temple money. And that if you needed to buy the sacrifice, then it had to be bought with temple money. And so there were exchange booths there where you could exchange your money for temple currency. And, oh, by the way, they charged 20, 25 cents on the dollar. So they were making money hand over fist as people from all over the world came to the temple for worship. Oh, and by the way, if you brought your own sacrifice, those corrupt priests that had bought their positions would look at them and inspect them because those animals that were to be sacrificed, they had to be perfect. They had to be flawless. Lambs could not have any spots, pigeons, doves, anything else that was to be offered. It had to be perfect, and so those corrupt priests would find flaws so that you had to buy one of their animals. And those animals were sold at triple the price that you could buy them at just outside of the city gate making money hand over fist. And what is more, those temple gates were thrown wide open and merchants, instead of going around the temple mount through the valley of Kidron into the city and through one of the other gates, they would cross through the court of the Gentiles through one door to another and so they were using it as a sidewalk, a shortcut to bring their wares into the city, into the city bazaar so that they could be sold there and do do business. And so what Jesus finds is the hustle and bustle of commerce in a place of worship. It's the second time he's done this. This time he goes out, waits an evening, comes back in. He finds a noisy, smelly, busy robber's den instead of a place of prayer for all people. What does he do? He cursed the fig tree for its fruitfulness. This time Jesus gets violent. He turns the high priest's shopping mall on its ear, this place of business into chaos. Can you allow the Holy Spirit to have your imagination for a moment? Because oftentimes we have this view of Jesus as the Renaissance Jesus. You know, he's thin and emaciated with big, sad blue eyes and long brown hair and pasty skin. <laughs> that wasn't Jesus at all. He walked everywhere he went, you know, tanned by the sun, dark curly hair, you know. I imagine he was a man's man growing up in a carpenter shop, calloused, rough hands, tough, commanded the attention of fishermen and tax collectors. There was nothing demure about him, even though he was a peaceable, gentle man and children loved him. That's the thing about kids, too. They know where they're safe, right? Seems the only thing that wasn't safe around Jesus was fraudulent religion. Sinners found comfort in his arms. The only people that didn't were hypocrites. There's a lesson in there somewhere for us. Isn't there? But give the Holy Spirit your imagination. As Jesus walks into the temple, and we're not told if he greeted anybody. The only thing we're told is that he taught them as he did this. But as he, as he spoke forcefully and intentionally, is it not written? My Father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. He walks over to the table of the money changers where they have their false scales and their piggy banks and he turns it over. Can you imagine that? That he just, he just walks over to the table, bends down, flings it into the air and coins go rattling across the marble floor of the temple court. That he walks over to the, to the stool of those that sold pigeons and he jerks it out from under them and sends it hurling across the temple court. That he walks over to the, to the cages where the doves that are being sold and he opens it and he sets them loose and he slaps the sheep 
on their rump and sends them running out of the table, out of the temple. I mean, it's just an amazing scene if you allow the Holy Spirit to grip your imagination. All the while, he's talking. And and, and I believe, this is my interpretation of it, and, and looking at the parallel that happened that marked the beginning of his ministry where Jesus fashioned a cat of nine tails, a whip, and drove them out. I rather imagine that there were a few shoving matches going on And maybe even some fists being thrown. That this was physical. This was a physical confrontation. Between Jesus. And a fraudulent system of religion. Now I say all of that to say this. I don't advocate you walking into work tomorrow. And calling everybody hypocrites. And turning over the desk of your boss. Okay don't do that you'll get fired. All right. But. We do realize that Jesus hates hypocrisy. Do we not? Mm. And that he, he physically confronts it with violence. Now, there are some other things going on here as he drives them out and he purges his father's house for the second time. He's hitting this corrupt system that had replaced worship with commerce in the pocketbook. All of the Sadducees that had purchased the high priest's office, that, that family, uh, that religious organization, it, it hit them in their pocketbook. So they come together with the Pharisees and the scribes, and they decide Jesus has got to go. They, 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 they're going to kill him. There, there's no more messing around here. He's got to go because he hit him in the pocketbook. They came together to destroy him. And so understanding, really, the lesson in all of this is that Jesus hates that kind of hypocrisy. How would he address that in our environment? I mean, if we're, if we're going to look ourselves in the mirror here and address the hypocrisy that exists in the church, and I'm not pointing my finger at you as much as I am simply making observations so that we can apply what we're learning How would Jesus respond to the environment of our worship? By the way, I'm thankful for the environment of Phillips Chapel. I don't say this because I'm condemning anything, but maybe we need to look at our hearts as we worship. Would he find us so busy that we have lost our purpose in worship? And look, I'm as guilty as anybody. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to be done on Sunday morning. And and, and when we we get here, we hit the ground running. I mean, this is a a busy time. And if if you're in ministry and you worship and serve here, then you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we can be guilty of treating church like just another opportunity to get something done. Can we not? That, that we can even treat our worship time as just something else to do. And so, would Jesus find us hiding behind activity instead of engaging in true worship? I think that is the question for us. That, that it, just like people hiding behind appearances... That, that sometimes we hide behind activity. And is that what he would find? I don't know. I don't know your heart. I know that sometimes I can be guilty of just ch- checking things off my to-do list. And I believe Jesus would confront that in me. If he was here, I believe Jesus would confront that in you. This is supposed to be a holy place of worship not a place to transact business. We could say a lot about the American church and how far we've gone down the rabbit hole as far as that goes, but but let's just limit our, our talk now to us. Let's think about us and how we approach worship, and sometimes we can be so irreverent about it. 
when we treat it as if it's just something else to do. That, that it's on our list of to-do things on a Sunday. We're going to get up and we're going to go to church and then we're going to go out to lunch and then we're going to go get groceries and then we've got to go to work and we've got to fill in here and we've got to do this and we've got to get ready for Monday and we've got to do this and we've got to do that and we've got to do this and it just it compounds. It becomes just another day of the week, a day of worship. A place of worship just becomes another place for us to transact business and to get stuff done and I think that breaks Jesus' heart. I think it makes him angry. I don't know if he'd walk in here with a whip and drive us out. That's not what I'm saying, but I do think he would confront us for treating worship like business. Don't you? So Jesus confronts fruitlessness in a fig tree. He confronts busyness, activity in a fraudulent religion. And then finally, that third vestige of the status quo, he confronts doubt in a faithless people, verses 20 through 25. They come back to the fig tree and and they see it dried up from the roots. Jesus cursed it the day before and now it's dead. It's not dying, it's dead. Peter remembers it. He draws it to Jesus' attention. Jesus, this tree is dead. And so immediately Jesus answers that question by saying, have faith in God. Don't you think that's an interesting answer? Peter says, Jesus, the tree you cursed is dead. And Jesus says to Peter, have faith in God. Peter's wondering how something like that could happen. Jesus makes a connection between the power of God and faith in God. This happened through the power of God, through my spoken word. That power is available to you through faith. It's an interesting scenario considering everything that has happened leading up to it. And then we can, we can answer any question that we might have, that any question that we might have that would arise about prayer in that statement. Because that's where Jesus goes, isn't it? He starts talking about prayer. Because Jesus spoke to the fig tree, we speak to God, we also sometimes speak to our circumstances, lost art, I think, in our culture, speaking God's word into our lives, but nonetheless, Jesus spoke, and it happened, and Jesus makes, draws the, the, a correlation to prayer. Any question that we have about how prayer works and what prayer accomplishes is answered in that statement, have faith. In God. We can be quick. Many have. There's entire movements out there. The word of faith movement. To lift this out of context. And proof text it. And come up with some false doctrine. Can we, can we settle on the truth of this passage. Simply by saying the key. To praying. Is faith. That's the key. The key to praying. This isn't. It's not name and claim it theology. You know, that's the word of faith stuff. If you believe something strongly enough, if you're sincere enough, if you say it enough, if you get the spell just right, if you say the right words, then then God is duty bound to give you what you ask for. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's heresy. And this isn't name it, claim it. It's not New Age philosophy either. And by the way, New Age philosophy is you just visualize. You know, the power uh, belongs in your mind. And that if, that if you just visualize a different circumstance for your life, and if you believe it sincerely enough, then, then, you, then you can change your world just simply through the power of your thinking. This isn't New Age philosophy either. It's not name and claim it. It's not New Age philosophy. What this is, Jesus is connecting prayer to faith. And the point is then, we need to believe when we pray. That's the point. That that when we come to God, when Jesus says, have faith in God when you pray, when we come to God, we can know that he hears and answers our prayers. And so this is faith in action then when we pray. We can also know that his answers are right. And that they're best. 
And so there's some other dynamics that are going on here that come to the surface that are implied. When Jesus says, have faith in God, he is implying familiarity with God himself. Isn't he? That, that, that faith is in God, his person, his nature. It is also implied that we are familiar with his command, God's word. We are having faith in God's word, his promises. It's all implied by that. There's a third implication, and that comes out in this idea of forgiveness in verse 25, that we're also familiar with grace, not just God's person and God's word, but also God's grace. When you stand in prayer, forgive. Forgive, otherwise, guess what? God don't hear you. And, and by the way, if we have bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts, guess what that really says about us? That we're not forgiven. I know that hurts, but that's what Jesus said, not just here, but he also said it in Matthew chapter 6 when he talked about prayer. He said it again in Matthew chapter 7, that if we don't forgive, then we're not forgiven. That if we're not gracious, we've never really experienced the grace of God ourselves. And so familiarity with God's grace is implied by this statement, have faith in God. That we're trusting in God, we're believing in his promise, and we're walking in grace. Does that make sense? And so loved ones, remember this. When we pray, we should be believing as we pray. We are to ask in faith, as James said in James chapter 1, verse 6, without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person, if you don't ask in faith, must not suppose that you will receive anything from the Lord because you're double-minded and unstable in all your ways. It's quite the indictment, isn't it? I wonder, then, as we seek some application here and we bring this to a close, how Jesus would respond We know that he hears us when we pray. But if he were to pray with us, and and by the way, I also know that he is praying with us right now, that Jesus is at the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession for us. That means that he is actively ministering and praying on our behalf right now. But if Jesus was bodily present, praying with us, Would he confront our lack of faith? I think often he would probably put his hand on my shoulder and say, Ben, why don't you believe me? Why don't you believe me? I I told you this in, in my word. Do you not believe my word? Why don't you trust me? Would his command to us to have faith in God reveal, does it reveal a status quo about our prayer, that our prayer lives, that, forgive me for being so bold, they're just words, not set in faith. Sometimes we do it out of obligation. Sometimes... We pray like heathen people do and we just repeat ourselves and we say the same thing over and over again as if somehow we have to rouse God from sleep or through our chanting we're somehow going to get his attention and God help us to be believing when we pray. That's my point. I'm not trying to condemn or to find fault. I just, I wonder sometimes if, if he would confront a nominal approach, a conventional approach to prayer these days. By simply saying, have faith in God. Believe me. And look, if we struggle with that, and I know that sometimes I do, can, can we not pray like the man who needed Jesus' help? And Jesus said, don't fear, only believe. 
And you remember his response? He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. How often we should pray that prayer. Lord, I believe you. Help me to believe you more. I want to believe you more, Lord. I want to trust you more. Some questions as we sum up here, and I'm done. I'm I wonder how Jesus would confront what is conventionally acceptable, the status quo in our church. And as I said at the beginning, I am so thankful for our church, but there are still sacred cows among us and still these vestiges of the status quo of convention and tradition that I think we need to be willing to address and deal with. And so... Honestly, the street view might be one thing, but what about the heart? Our activities are fun, man. I enjoy ministering with you, and I enjoy what we do, but is it bearing fruit? Are the things that we do bearing fruit? Man, everything looks good. And we, 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 we're trying to do as things as excellently as we possibly can. But is the prayer room empty? Are we failing to darken the door of our prayer closets because we are so busy doing other things in the name of religion? As Jesus deals with these things that are so often conventional yet fruitless in us, may God give us the faith to repent of them and to be fruitful. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, please help us. Lord, if I'm honest, I... There are sometimes I hide behind the appearance of things because I don't ever have to deal with my heart, my own heart. I don't want to do that anymore. And there are times that I get so caught up in activity, busyness, and business. And there are times that I hide behind that too. That I convince myself because I got a lot on my plate that I'm doing ministry. And Lord, that's not always the case. I don't want to be that way. I want to be fruitful. I want our church to be fruitful, Lord. You have chosen us to bear much fruit and then our fruit should remain. Father, forgive us because our, our prayer closets are empty. How often at the end of the service we, we close in a word of prayer and yet we, we're all thinking about what comes next rather than, than praying. Help us to be willing to deal with these things, Spirit of God, as you convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. In Jesus' name.